I just wanted to read you guys a little bit of something out of a book called The Great Evangelical Disaster. And it's chapter 8 called The Mark of a Christian. The Great Evangelical Disaster by Francis Schaeffer. And this is just a book, just a man's commentary and insight. Through the centuries, men have displayed many different symbols to show that they are Christians. They have worn marks in the lapels of their coats, hung chains about their necks, even had special haircuts. Of course, there is nothing wrong with any of this if one feels it is his calling. But there is a much better sign, a mark that has not been thought up just as a matter of expediency, for that has not been thought up as some special occasion or in some specific era. It is a universal mark that is to last through all the ages of the church till Jesus comes back. What is this mark? At the close of his ministry, Jesus looks forward to his death on the cross, the open tomb, and the ascension. Knowing that he is about to leave, Jesus prepares his disciples for what is to come. It is here that he makes clear what will be the distinguishing mark of the Christian. John 13, 33-35 Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, Whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, A new commandment I give unto you, That ye love one another, as I have loved you, That ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. This passage reveals the mark that Jesus gives to label a Christian, not just in one era or in one locality, but at all times and all places until Jesus returns. Notice that what he says here is not a description of a fact. It is a command which includes a condition. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye love one another, that all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. And if is involved, if you obey, if you obey, you will wear the badge Christ gave. But since this is a command, it can be violated. The point is that it is possible to be a Christian without showing this mark. But if we expect non-Christians to know that we are Christians, we must show the mark. The command at this point is to love our fellow Christians, our brothers. But of course, we must strike a balance and not forget the other side of Jesus' teaching. We are to love our fellow men, to love all men, in fact, as our neighbors. All men bear the image of God. They have value, not because they are redeemed, but because they are God's creation and God's image. Modern man, who has rejected this, has no clue as to who he is, and because of this he can find no real value for himself or for other men. Hence, he downgrades the value of other men and produces the horrible thing we face today, a sick culture in which men treat men as inhuman, as machines. As Christians, however, we know the value of men. All men are our neighbors, and we are to love them as ourselves. We are to do this on the basis of creation, even if they are not redeemed. For all men have value because they are made in the image of God. Therefore, they are to be loved even at a great cost. This is, of course, the whole point of Jesus' story of the Good Samaritan. 
because a man is a man, he is to be loved at all costs. So when Jesus gives the special command to love our Christian brothers, it does not negate the other command. The two are not antithetical. We are not to choose between loving all men as ourselves and loving the Christian in a special way. The two commands reinforce each other. If Jesus had commanded so strongly that we love all men as our neighbors, then how important it is, especially to love our fellow Christians. If we are told to love all men as our neighbors, as ourselves, then surely, when it comes to those with whom we have the special bonds as fellow Christians, having one Father through one Jesus Christ, and being indwelt by one Spirit, we can understand how overwhelmingly important it is that all men be able to see an observable love for those with whom we have these special ties. Paul makes the double obligation clear in Galatians 6.10. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. It does not negate the command to do good to all men, but it is still not meaningless to add, especially unto them who are over the household of faith. This dual goal should be our Christian mentality to set off our to the set of our minds. We should be consciously thinking about it and what it means in our one moment at a time lives. It should be the attitude that governs our outward observable actions. Very often the true Bible-believing Christian, in his emphasis on two humanities, one lost, one saved, one still standing in rebellion against God, the other having returned to God through Christ, has given a picture of exclusiveness which is ugly. There are two humanities, that is true. Some men made in the image of God still stand in rebellion against him. Some, by the grace of God, have cast themselves upon God's solution. Nonetheless, there is in another very important sense only one humanity. All men derive from one origin. By creation, all men bear the image of God. In this sense, all men are of one flesh, one blood. Hence, the exclusiveness of the two humanities is undergirded by the unity of all men. And Christians are not to love their believing brothers to the exclusion of their non-believing fellow men. That is ugly. We are to have the example of the Good Samaritan consciously in the mind at all times. The first commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. The second commandment bears the universal command to love men. Notice that the second commandment is not just to love Christians. It is far wider than this. We are to love our neighbor as ourselves. 1 Thessalonians 3.12 carries the same double emphasis. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another, and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Here, the order is reversed. First of all, we are to have love one toward another, and then toward all men. But that does not change the double emphasis. Rather, it points up the delicate balance, a balance that is not in practice automatically maintained. In 1 John 3.11, written later than the gospel that bears his name, John says, For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Years after Christ's death, John, in writing this epistle, calls us back to Christ's original command in John 13. Speaking to the church, John, in effect, says, Don't forget this. Don't forget this. This command was given to us by Christ while he still was on earth. This is, too, to be your mark. I'll read a little more. 
Till next time.